Welcome back to the Borough Shire Podcast. I'm Brandon Vaught, and I'm here with Father Blake Britton, my best friend. We are excited to join you to talk about Disney and theology. Disney <laughs> and theology. Before we get there, though, you may have detected by seeing me on camera that I carry an extra air of dignity. And if that's the case, your senses are both perceptive and accurate because I hold up here on camera <laughs> an official proclamation that was given to me by Father Blake Britton about a few weeks ago uh, since our last episode for my birthday. And let me just read the opening line for you. This is an official proclamation. You'll see it's uh, signed uh, and established by the proper authorities. But here's what it says. Whereas... Lord Brandon Vaught, Lord Brandon Vaught. I'm going to have to change uh, the uh, the uh, lower third graphic on the podcast to reflect this. Lord Brandon Vaught has, uh, by this notice, on the 11th day of May in the year 2021, in the 68th reign, in the 68th year of the reign of our sovereign, Lady Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain, and Northern Ireland, and of her other realms and territories, Queen, head of the commonwealth, defender of the faith, debatedly, delivered <laughs> unto us a this intention to purchase and us with the intention to accept, uh, established titles has agreed with the Lord, that would be myself, to bequeath unto them a, de a dedication of a plot of land of precisely one square foot in Scotland. And it goes on to define that piece of land. Long story short, I am now the owner of a small peerage, a small plot of land in Scotland, which has come with it the designation of Lord. Again, it's, it's official. It's right there, proclamation. <laughs> so Father Blake has his title of priestly father. I now have mine as Lord, and I expect it to be used every time you address me, Blake. Oh, most certainly Lord Brandon Vaught of Scotland. I will always <laughs> honor that title here and forever. And I almost regret now buying that for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still looking forward never to when, the end of it. When no, you and I, I mean, take it's, a, it's funny. Uh, Brandon and I were, were joking around uh, last time that we were visiting one another at Burrowshire and just we know one another's hearts so well. We're such close friends, and so when we want to get one another a gift, it, it, there's always this investigation that goes into it. You know, and we just it's something unique and something that speaks to our character. And so I was looking for for something for your birthday. And I stumbled across that in this commercial on YouTube, and I was like, let's see if if it's legit or not. It ended up being totally legit, and I was like, okay, I want this, so I know that Brandon would want this. <laughs> um, and so I'm very happy that I was able to get you that title of Lord Brandon Vaught and uh, Lord Brandon of Borrowshire. I think that has a wonderful uh, sort of ring to it. <laughs> I'm looking forward to when we go to Scotland because I'm, I'm very eager not only to defend my one square foot of land, but perhaps to expand it into yeah. adjacent areas. Well, I'm going to buy one as well. So I think the Vought and Britain clans should unite and, you know, just start taking over a Scotland square foot by square foot. You know, we could have a very large territory there in Glockenshire. So. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, let us transition to the topic of our discussion today, which is Disney and theology. Now, we did an episode uh, a couple shows back on St. Augustine, which is a city here in Florida of which we're very fond and proud um, especially because both of us have grown up here in Central Florida. We've gone to St. Augustine for most of our lives. The same thing is true on steroids uh, when it comes to Disney. Um, both of us just grew up in the whole Disney culture, you know, not just watching Disney movies and enjoying them, but both of us living so close to the four major theme parks at Walt Disney World. We, you know, went there tons of times. I was just thinking about it this morning, trying to calculate how many times I've probably been there and by my estimate, it's somewhere around 200 times yeah. over my 35 years. And uh, I love it. It's such a part of, of my childhood. And now what, what, what my, my own children's childhood, we bring our kids there. Blake and has come with our family to Disney several times. Uh, but let's, let's talk a little bit about our experiences with Disney growing up first. And then we'll maybe transition into some of the movies and talk about those. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Well, you start, brother, because I know you have a funny story with your own family at Disney. Yeah, my, my family, in particular, my mother and her two brothers are all involved with entertainment. So growing up, they would do dancing, they do stage plays, um, particularly ballet and more athletic forms of, of dancing, uh, band, marching band, all that kind of stuff. So they've always been performers. And 
they were, I think, in their late teens to early 20s when Disney first opened in the 1970s down here in Florida. And so I, I always get this. I can't remember exactly if it was all three of them or one or two of them who were there at the opening ceremonies of Walt Disney World. Uh, but I do know that all all of my aunts and uncles have participated in in Disney by playing the characters, by performing on stage. Uh, my mom uh, played Mary Poppins. I, she, I think she Gosh. was either the first or the second Mary Poppins that they had. So my mother is is quite literally Mary Poppins. Um, <laughs> my my mom and my uncles have played all of the Disney characters. So I think Goofy, Pluto, Mickey Mouse, uh, all the characters with the big uh, helmets. And they would tell me at the time, like, Th- things have significantly improved in the costume department at Disney World to where now they're, you know, sleeker, more comfortable. You're standing out in 100 degree Florida weather. But back then when Disney first started, you, it was like you're putting a sauna on top of somebody and right. the characters would faint left and right. They'd faint within the costume. So you kind of <laughs> just be standing there. You know, the person would be knocked out, but they're still standing up with this big helmet on and people would be taking pictures with them. Uh, but anyway, it goes goes deep in my family. Um, up until just a, a few years ago, my uncle was working there, and so we've we've always had close family and close friends working at Disney, a part of Disney. So it's it's got a not just a personal connection, but a family connection for myself. And I know that's true for you too, right? D- Disney runs in the in the veins of the of the Britain family as well. It really does. Um, I have a similar story to yours insofar as my family's been involved with Disney for a while, but particularly my grandfather. And I'm a very proud, you know, member of the the Disney uh, <laughs> fanatic group, I guess you could say. Um, but. My grandfather actually knew the Disney family personally. Reason being is that uh, he was working as a machinist in a shipyard in Tampa, and he was trained on how to build build different forms of uh, machinations and machines. And one day, there was this man who came to him who uh, had this idea of having a theme park in Orlando. And uh, this theme park, he really wanted locomotive trains. Uh, and so he asked my grandfather, would you be interested in taking and moving to Orlando to help build these locomotive trains for what would eventually become Walt Disney World? Um, and so my grandfather was the first and only foreman of Walt Disney for 40 years. Uh, and he actually is the one that built all the locomotive trains that are still at the Magic Kingdom till this day. Um, he took them from the Panama Canal Project. They were shipped to Tampa. My grandfather would then uh, refurbish them rebuild them pretty much from scratch inside and out, paint them. He would dedicate them to different members of the Disney family um, or their friends and then put them on the tracks. And they're the same ones that are there to the, that are there to this day. So it, it was just incredible as a boy. Uh, for example, I got to see one of the trains before anyone else did when he first finished making the Lily Bell, which is one of the green trains. Um, and it was just unbelievable. I went there and he had it underneath this wonderful tapestry and no one had seen it yet. He just finished painting it and he pulled it down. He said, you're the first non-employee to see this. And uh, I was maybe like 10 or 11 years old at the time. And he picked me up at 4 a.m. that morning from my house. And I don't think I slept at all that night. <laughs> And uh, and drove me down there. I got to go behind the scenes and see sort of Disney World at nighttime uh, when the park still closed. And uh, so it is. It's just deep in my blood. And obviously having a grandfather who was active there for so many decades, we got free passes as much as we wanted. So um, I went there with my brothers and sisters and my family at least once a month growing up. I mean, we were there all the time. And like you, it's it's been hundreds of times. I never get tired of it. There's this special spirit of of childlikeness that Disney World possesses, um, and it really invokes that within your soul when you go there. You just feel you feel safe, innocent, and free, uh, and, and that and that's one of the things that Walt Disney really wanted. Walt was an amazing man. I mean, my grandfather deeply loved him, and loved the Disney family, um, and he was just a very virtuous, upstanding man who specifically loved family life and to support family life. And that was the main reason behind these parks and these movies was to encourage family values. I went on a big uh, Walt Disney reading kick a couple years ago. Actually, we were having the annual G.K. Chesterton conference down here in Orlando, and I was preparing a talk comparing G.K. Chesterton to Walt Disney. And actually, my my good friend Nancy Brown ended up, she she had already claimed that talk, so she ended up (laughs) giving it and did an outstanding job. But I was reading all these Disney biographies. Uh, by the way, if, if uh, listeners want the best biography of, of Walt Disney, it's by Neil Gabler. I'll include a link in the show notes here, but it's called Walt Disney, The Triumph of the American Imagination. 
uh, fantastic, comprehensive biography. I think it's like five or 600 pages. But anyway, what emerges when you study the person of Walt Disney is he wasn't, he wasn't ostensibly religious. He, was, he believed in God, we're pretty sure, but didn't really go to church, but was a man of incredibly deep virtue, strong imagination, and pro-family, as you were just saying. The, the whole Disney enterprise arose out of his desire to give to his, his daughters what didn't exist, you know, a place like Disney World where you could go and enter into a story. You're not just riding rides and, and having a good time. You're entering into a new world, entering into a new story. It reminds me of what we talked about, Blake, on the episode of video games, why so many people are drawn into video games. Um, it's not just like, like the games people are into today are not like Pong, where it's right. just a, a mindless diversion, where you're just trying to play a game to win or something like that. The games that, that draw most people are immersive, they're mission-driven, they have purpose, and they, they make you feel greater than you are. And I think that's the great secret to the, to the Disney magic, is they pull you into the story, they align you with these characters who embody great virtues, overcome struggles, but then achieve great virtue. And, and that's what the human heart hungers for. That's why so many people are drawn to the work of Disney. Yeah, absolutely. Walt was an amazing person to make you still believe that magic existed in the world. And somewhere along the line, we allow that to be beat out of us when we enter into adulthood. We allow the secularism of the world. We allow the sort of the bitterness and callousness of the world to break our spirit of idealism, of joy and of childlike uh, wonder and fascination with existence. Well, Walt wanted to make a place and also to create an industry which fostered that notion of wonder. And I mean, he did an amazing job. And there's something that is very deeply Christian about that. That is why Christ says, unless you have the heart of a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What he's speaking there, too, is not just it's not naivete. He's speaking about this inherent ability of a child to never lose fascination with being, uh, to have this wonder before being constantly. And ultimately, that wonder, of course, is, is the fascination with God himself. But Walt and his whole industry is, has done a magnificent job really cultivating an environment uh, to where that wonder continues to be manifested in hearts until this day. And that's why still tens of millions of children and adults around the world love Disney. It's funny, I was speaking to some of my peers who are millennials like us, and they mentioned how you know they don't know who has more fun at Disney anymore, <laughs> whether it's their kids or them, because our parents really didn't grow up with Disney per se, meaning like going to the parks or having the same kind of movie experiences that we did in the 80s and 90s. So our generation was one of the first to really be formed by Disney movie culture and have it, you know, always playing in our homes. The background is sort of our, our bread and butter of, of imagination. Uh, so we love Disney just as much as our kids do now. <laughs> so when I go with the Vought family uh, or one of the other parish families, I mean, I have just as much fun as the kids do. You know, they want to go home. I'm like, no, let's stay, Brandon. Let's stay. Can we please stay? Can we please stay? No, please, Father Blake. <laughs> Well, I, for the rest of this episode, I want to take a look at some of the most significant films from the Disney lineup, mainly the ones during this so-called Disney Renaissance or the Disney decade, which lasted from about 1989 to 1999. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about some of the major themes and specifically how they tie into Catholicism. I think it's it's interesting to read them through a Catholic lens. Yeah. Before we get there, though, before we talk about these landmark, timeless, significant films, I do want to add... A couple caveats. Um, Father Blake and I are not uncritical enthusiasts for Disney. We recognize a lot of the shortcomings, especially over the last 20 or so years. Right. Um, both of us will agree, and I'll let you speak to this in a minute, that in many ways, Disney has lost its way. Disney's lost the way of its original founder. I don't think that's any secret to, to people watching new Disney movies over the last handful of years. They've become emphatically politically correct, like overly, overly accommodating to contemporary cultural norms. Um, even when, like in some of these live action remakes of the original animated films, they'll intentionally tweak characters or stories to make them more accommodating to the current cultural climate and accepted morals. Also, as a company, I think Disney has become way more commercialistic than it used to be. They, by most accounts, don't treat their employees well, their cast members well. Um, that's a complaint that goes all the way back to, to Walt himself. Uh, but I, I just want to emphasize here, but by us celebrating the merits of Disney, please don't understand us to be saying 
everything is great. Disney's right. just heaven on earth. It's it's magnificent and above criticism in any way. Um, but talk about, I know you wanted to say a couple things about, about this specific caveat, how Disney has sort of drifted from its, its main mission that, that Disney outlined for it. Yeah, this was one of my grandfather's greatest sorrows. I remember seeing my grandfather on his back porch have tears in his eyes when he spoke about Walt Disney, uh, when he spoke about the Disney family and their vision for the theme parks and for the movie industry and sort of where it had gone in contradiction to that vision. And the fact of the matter is, is that the people who are currently running Disney, many of them, um, are not there for the sake of family values and in order to cultivate these true American spirit. Uh, they're there to try to make a buck and to really appease, like you said, the secular norms. And that's that's a tragedy. And, and they will take some of even things that Walt himself came up with, like some of these old movies, and remake them. Uh, in order to try to promote certain political agendas, whether that be same-sex marriage or transgenderism or or having all sorts of different things go on throughout their films. Uh, again, more in the past 10 to 15 years than I've ever seen um, in in the previous movies. So, so yeah, I mean, I'm right there with you, and I would 100% uh, caution parents in particular to discern anything that Disney put out, <laughs> you know, starting from the 90s onwards. Uh, unfortunately, to really discern that because uh, the company started making a drastic turn in its focus from family life values at that time. Um, there's still good things there, of course. There's still wonderful things to watch that Disney does produce. I hope they don't ever lose it all. Um, and I really, we pray for their conversion. That's one of the things that we as Catholics have to do. Um, when we recognize that a company has started off in a good way and it's then losing its focus, we need to pray for the conversion because Disney, in my opinion, has really taken the place of some of the great common storytellers of history. So we had Mother Goose. We had the Brothers Grimm. You know, we have sort of these universal stories that cross races and cultures and go throughout continents. Well, we really don't have too much of that anymore. We need them for every single decade or every single century. And I think that Disney has become that new great storyteller. You know, when Disney tells a story, the entire world knows it. And you could go to China, you could go to uh, Europe, you can go to the United States or anywhere in North America, and all of us know the same stories. And that's a really powerful instrument for evangelization and for cultivation of positive culture. But if we don't use it appropriately, then it starts disseminating poison throughout the world. So Disney's in a great spot to positively influence culture. I would really ask them to please do so in an authentic way. Um, and I know that there are many people who work for Disney who do have that in their hearts. They want to make children happy. They want to form family values. Um, so my prayer is that they just return to that mission, especially as as a man whose family was so deeply involved with the Disney family personally, um, it really it's important to me, and I know it's important to all of us who who love what they've created in the past. One of the things our family has really enjoyed is the release of Disney Plus. So I know a lot of readers and or readers, a lot of listeners to this <laughs> podcast will know Disney Plus, but we signed up right when that came out. We like agreed to the three year deal because we're like this, we're gonna love this, and. The genius of it is it it opens up the entire past library of Disney films. So our family spends most of the time like 90s and pre 90s in this right. massive Disney archive. In fact, w one of the things we started doing is we we printed out a chronological list of all of Disney's films. I think going all the way back to Snow White, the first major feature length film, and we've been watching them chronologically, all in order. And some of these older films that are mostly forgotten are so splendid yes. um, our fan one of the ones that really stuck out for our family was the original live action uh version of swiss family robinson oh so good was, I, yeah I, I remember talking to you about it yeah we we love it's such a healthy depiction of a family of survival of discipline lots of religion in it because it's they're dependent on providence and so they're they're constantly mentioning providence praying to providence um so it's it's this these early iterations of the Disney films where religion and transcendence are respected and taken seriously. Um, the early animated films are so great. So if any if any parent is looking to to take advantage of this Disney magic and storytelling, but's a little hesitant with the more recent films, Disney Plus is a is a way to to get into that and get back to the original films that Walt himself produced. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk through this Disney Renaissance because this is this contains most of the films that I think and you would agree are 
the most intriguing at the level of philosophy, theology, Christianity. So just a, a quick summary here, beginning in the late 80s and then moving through the late 90s, so a, a rough decade here, roughly 10 years, Disney released hit after hit after hit. Um, so you'll find Disney fans describe it as either the Disney Renaissance or the Disney decade. But let me tick off some of these films here that were released in this short 10 year span. It began with Little Mermaid, 1989. Next year, Rescuers Down Under. Next year, Beauty and the Beast. Next year, Aladdin. In 1994, Lion King. 95, Pocahontas. 96, Hunchback of Notre Dame, probably the most Catholic film Disney's ever released. Yeah. 97, Hercules. 98, Mulan. 99, Tarzan. Uh, what do you what do you attribute this success to? Why why all of a sudden in ten years they released some of the classics of the classics among their hundreds of movies? Yeah, well, it was a reorganization of their team. So uh, right during the 1960s, 70s time period, Disney was going through sort of a lull in movie making. It had had several successful films before that, but it was, uh, again, going through this lull. And one of the major things that contributed to that was a man named Don Bluth, who was a fantastic animator. He decided to sort of go out on his own and make his own studio to compete with Disney. And he made some outstanding films that gave Disney a run for their money in that time period. Not least of which is something like American Tell. So that's Feifel. Feifel goes west. We, a lot of us grew up with that. All Dogs Go to Heaven, Anastasia. Some of these movies that uh, that people confuse for Disney movies. <laughs> They're like, oh, I thought Anastasia was a Disney film. Well, that's why, because of the Disney animator and creator who went off on his own. Uh, and so Disney was really scrambling to try to find a way to reassert itself as the king of this uh, animated child industry. Uh, and it found that in the form of two men. You had a man named Howard Asherman, and then, of course, most famously, you had Alan Menken. Alan Menken. Now, Alan Menken, they were both Broadway professionals, um, and they came in and started working with Disney to focus their films more on having a musical kind of feel rather than just being so story-driven. Uh, and so Alan comes up with this idea of composing pretty much musicals um, that are set to anim animated film and stories. Um, and so he writes the music for The Little Mermaid, which are some of these timeless tales that we know up until this day. Um, and he, Alan Minkin, actually wrote the soundtracks for all the movies that we just listed except for Tarzan. That was done by Phil Collins, and it's noticeably different. Uh, Phil Collins, of course, is a pop uh, artist, um, artist, excuse me. And... Um, so yeah, so I, I wouldn't really put Tarzan with all of those, although it is part of the Disney Renaissance era category. Uh, but you know, a whole new world, part of your part of the world, uh, uh, Hakuna Matata, Beauty and the Beast, all these things are written by Alan Menken, and uh, you also had, of course, um, Elton John who contributed to The Lion King. Uh, and so they just brought in some heavy hitter composers and started putting more focus on the musicality of the movies besides just the story plot. The stories are amazing as well. Um, so I think the combination of music, animation, and powerful stories is what really gave birth to this new age of, of Disney World. And it was amazing because very quickly they reasserted themselves as sort of the uh, the crowning jewel of animated industry. It was, it's pretty impressive. And like you said, until this day, most of us can sing, <laughs> sing the, song, the songs and name the stories from all these movies, you know? Let's look at a question a lot of people ask, especially parents. Uh, are Disney movies Christian? I hear that a lot. And it's a tough question to answer. Um, obviously, there's not a lot of explicit Christianity in most of the films. You'll be hard-pressed to find a church or an explicit reference to God in many of the films. Although, I will note, many people forget this, that in the original Fantasia film, there's a, a long sequence where you have these nuns, for lack of a better word, there's sort of these mysterious veiled women walking through the woods singing Ave Maria, Ave Maria, the heaven's bride, the bells ring out in solemn praise. So you have one of the earliest and most famous Disney films with a hymn of praise to Our Lady. Uh, I'm not sure you can get much more Christian than that, <laughs> but uh, what would you say to that question? Are, are the Disney films Christian? 
Yeah. So we have to identify what it means to be Christian. Uh, so Christian culture, specifically in art, is diffusive, not necessarily explicit. So there are things that are explicitly Christian in art. Think of, for example, Michelangelo's Pietà or think of the Sistine Chapel. And that is the most beautiful art in the world. Why? Because it explicitly depicts the most beautiful thing to ever exist, which is the incarnation, the, the Christian mystery, salvation. That being said, there are multiple ways to embody the ideals, virtues uh, of Christianity without being explicitly Christian. And in that sense, uh, I believe Disney is incredibly Christian because it does an amazing job, just as J.R.R. Tolkien does, for example, in Lord of the Rings or C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia. It does a wonderful job using signs, symbols, mythology in order to imbue within the heart of its viewer these amazing virtues and these deep sentiments of human culture. I'd agree with that. I'd say another thing that the Disney films do to prepare the way for Christianity is almost all of them recognize transcendence. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's the magic of spells and fairy tales or it's just this idea that there's some governing force, something bigger here than just you know mere human decisions. They they almost all recognize there's something more to the world than just its material reality. I think Lord of the Rings does this in a similar way that it sort of primes the pump for an acceptance of a transcendent religion like Christianity. Because as young kids, they're they're being reminded, if not taught, that the material world isn't all there is. And yes. so it might not be explicitly Christian, but I'd say it's kind of playing a John the Baptist role. It's preparing the way for Christianity so that like uh, it's it's the Tolkien Lewis line that Christianity is myth made real. Right. It's all the things you love about myths, but in the person of Jesus Christ, they come true. All of the glory, the adventure, the sacrifice, the virtue, the honor— we love those things because God wired our hearts to anticipate them in Christ. And so Christ is the the myth made real, the true myth. Christianity is the true myth. And yeah. Disney is a like a propedeutic. It prepares the way for that. Oh, absolutely. It's amazing. Uh, a couple weeks ago before school was let out with the kids, um, I was preaching a school mass. And we were talking about Peter and his conversion. You know, the fact that Peter denied Christ and Peter's coming back to Christ. And you could just go and preach a homily on that conversion itself, and the kids might get it. Most of them probably wouldn't. Um, but I start my homily saying, who here has seen Moana? <laughs> you know, Moana is, of course, a really fantastic <laughs> Disney Pixar film. It's actually one of the best ones they've made, in my opinion. Um, and, of course, every single kid in the entire church raised their hand. Uh, and I went through how Moana, in order to try to save her village, you know, finds the heart of Tahiti and puts it back in and how Tahiti was really the good person all along, but her heart was taken out. And that's why she was a demon, how we're all essentially good. And Peter had this essential goodness within him. Needless to say, Moana became this evangelical tool. And you could see the kids nodding their heads emphatically when I related Tahiti and her salvation um, and also Moana and her ability to put the heart of the ocean back where it belonged to Peter reclaiming his heart in the heart of Christ. And realizing who he really was and that he wasn't the villain, that he was able to see goodness in himself because Christ saw goodness in himself. Uh, and it was just it was beautiful. Like you said, it prepared their hearts to receive now a deeper seed of faith, which is the beauty of salvation and redemption. Uh, and that's something that we as Catholics really have to remember is that when it comes to evangelization, we have to be as gentle as doves and as cunning as serpents. And that necessitates the eyes to see grace wherever grace is to be found, to name it and to use it for the sake of Christ and the gospel. We did an episode some months ago on what to watch and how to watch it, something along those lines. Like, how do you determine what movies, music, you know, documentaries, whatever, how do you determine what's good to take in and what you should avoid? And we shared some principles in that episode that I think apply well to these Disney films. One of them was don't judge the merits of a film based on how explicit is its presentation of Christianity. Rather, ask yourselves, do these movies help or hinder my faith? And right. under that umbrella of faith, you could include development in the moral life, you know, inculcation of virtue. Does, do these films make me want to become more virtuous or less? That's a good litmus test for deciding uh, what, whether something is not just compatible with, but facilitates your, your Christian faith. And by my book, most of the movies during this Disney decade, I would give an emphatic 
yes, I yes. think not only do they harmonize with Christianity, but they facilitate it. They they draw you into the moral life and and call you to a greater virtue. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I mean, I would strongly encourage this to any parent trying to form their child in virtue. Some of these early movies, um, they just for me as a kid, I remember growing up watching them. I grew up on Disney movies. I grew up on Disney World, the theme parks, <laughs> you know, but I also grew up on Disney movies and they still stick with me t- until this day. And they taught me valuable lessons. I know we're about to go through a couple of them right now from that Renaissance period. But um, till this day, as a grown man, as a priest, I remember those. And they did prepare my heart to mature those virtues as an adult, you know. So we definitely don't want to put these down. And and uh, and anything that isn't explicitly Christian, we have to have that discerning eye and that grace of wisdom from the Spirit to recognize where his movements are in it. All right, let's turn to some of the actual films itself. Let's see, we've got four films that really stick out to Father Blake and I as demonstrating really important and clear Christian themes. So the four we'll look at are Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King, and Hunchback of Notre Dame, all four during this Disney renaissance, this Disney decade. Um, We could probably spend a whole episode on each one of them. It would be fun sometime to like watch through them together and and maybe offer some, some commentary like Mystery Science Theater style but um we'll we'll treat each of them somewhat briefly here so let's start with beauty and the beast now this is my favorite disney movie Mm. love beauty and the beast love especially the soundtrack of beauty and the beast it's my my favorite soundtrack of all from uh it's one of the few no let me let me clarify i think it's the only disney film for which we have a quote about it from gk chesterton now chesterton (laughs) of course, died uh, before Disney got going. Uh, so never saw any of the Disney films, but it's the only story on which a film, Disney film was based that Chesterton commented on. Here's what Chesterton says. This is the great lesson of beauty and the beast, that a thing must be loved before it is lovable. Yes. A thing must be loved before it is lovable. And as soon as I read that, a, a million little things all clicked together in my mind with that line. Because, yes, that's so resonant with the film, right? That Bell has to love the beast in his beastly form. Not when he's the prince, not when he's easy to love, not when he has refined manners, but when he's acting beastly and grisly and cruelly to her. She has to love him to save him before he's lovable. But it also called immediately to mind the whole kerygma, the gospel message, that Christ loves us before we were lovable, before we were saved, when we were still trapped in our sin. He nevertheless loved us to the point of death. And then flowing out of that, our call to love others, to will the good of others, especially enemies. You know, this is the, the crux of the Sermon on the Mount and the most difficult and challenging line within it that we're called not just to love our friends and those who treat us nice, but to love our enemies. You're, tr- you're to love them even before they're lovable. So to me, that's not just the core message of, of Christianity and not just its greatest fruit, that, that through Christ's death, he's enabled Christians to love even the unlovable before they're lovable. But I love the, the Chesterton analysis of that film. Uh, You want to say something else about Beauty and the Beast? (laughs) I could say a ton about Beauty and the Beast. (laughs) Uh, As a musician, I mean, again, I could do a whole podcast episode just on the music of Disney. Um, Alan Menken is a genius. Uh, My brother's professional composer. Uh, He composes orchestrations, and he says Alan Menken is one of the great geniuses of our time, you know, along with John Williams and and some of these other American composers. Uh, He just has this ability to make even simple chord progressions sound fresh and new. Uh, And I know you and I will listen to Disney soundtracks by Alan Menken on a on a regular basis. So the soundtrack, putting that aside, it's magnificent and it's one of the best I think Disney has ever produced. As far as the story goes, the animation, the way that Disney chose to wrote, uh, excuse me, to write the story. uh, One thing in particular sticks out to me. When I was teaching middle school humanities, I required that my eighth grade class watched the final scene of Beauty and the Beast, the Disney version, the animated uh, Beauty and the Beast. Because in that scene, you have the beast who has surrendered beauty So he fell in love with beauty. He realized that beauty loved him. And that is what gave him the power to now let it be free. So before he was trying to possess beauty to use it to in order to liberate himself from the witch's curse. 
but it's only when he authentically falls in love that he lets that he surrenders beauty let's go let let's beauty have its way and so then bell leaves and he's resigned himself to being a beast for the rest of his life but that's more important because love is more beautiful uh and that actually drives him then to selflessly sacrifice himself against Gaston in that battle. And he loses his life. So now he surrendered not only beauty, but he surrenders his own existence for the sake of this woman that has called out his greatness, that's truly loved him as he is. And it's only when he has taken his final breath, it's when he's given everything, when he's com- become completely altruistic, completely selfless, that you hear those words fly from the mouth of beauty. I love you. And when those words are spoken, the beast life is renewed within him. There's something so mystical in that for our own Christian journey that we most become ourselves. We are most ourselves not only in being loved, but also in loving in return and responding to that love with selfless sacrifice. It's only when we're willing to give up our life in every single facet of it that we truly become who we are in the deepest senses of our being. And so this beast is now made human. Sin makes people beasts. That's what made the beast a beast to begin with. He was selfish. He was a young, handsome prince who only cared about lust and who only cared about his own reputation. And that's why he became what he loved, which was the sin. But it's when he's taken into grace, into beauty, into goodness, into truth, that he redeems who he most essentially is as a human person. So, yeah, I mean, there's just so much there. And like I said, I, it was required viewing <laughs> for my eighth grade class. Um, and I still cry every time I see that scene because I see myself. This is what Jesus Christ did for me. He looked at me in my sinfulness and he says, I love you. I love you anyways. Uh, and that's what's made me a priest. That's what's made me the man that I am this day is that the fathers looked at me and he's loved me. Uh, so there's just something very touching about that scene. All right, let's turn to Aladdin, Mm. another classic favorite of our childhood. I remember growing up singing all the Aladdin songs, dressing up like Aladdin. I had Aladdin fever in our house. Um, But you have recognized this theme of what you call the surrender of Nietzschean power in the film Aladdin, that this is a sort of leitmotif, its main theme. Talk about that. Yeah, so um, for for our audience, I have done years of extensive research (laughs) philosophically and maybe too much uh, into Disney culture. I, I have a great fam- friend. Her name is Elizabeth Busby. She actually has a wonderful podcast that she does with the uh, TOB Institute on marriage. I strongly suggest everyone to listen to it. And uh, he, her and I are just Disney addicts. We love Disney. I'm sure she's going to love this episode. Um, and so we will talk for hours sometimes just about these sort of themes. That's why I have so many motifs and philosophical opinions on it. But uh, Aladdin. Yeah, uh, I've watched Aladdin multiple times, all these movies. Uh, and what I see in Aladdin is this is this, this fight, this tension between Nietzschean sense of power and this, again, that selfless surrendering sense of power. So you have the lamp, which is very symbolic of worldly authority. The lamp is this source of, of ultimate power in the world. And, and whoever possesses it in the end really controls history, controls reality. So Jafar is seeking it with this selfish passion. Now, Aladdin is not really seeking it. He finds it by mistake. But being sort of a shallow person at first, he's, you know, as he says, a street rat, right? They call him a street rat. Um, but really, just he's lived a life just trying to get by. Uh, he, he has a good heart. He's trying to be good, but life circumstances have really come against him. And so he also uses the lamp for sort of these selfish purposes at the beginning. Uh, and later on, though, he ends up falling in love with Jasmine. And there's also theology, the body component and all this, how women are the ones that really draw out of the men their ultimate virtue. I think that's something so powerful in Disney films. But Jasmine is what ultimately allows Aladdin to let the lamp go. And he surrenders the lamp and its power so much to the point that he even wishes with his last wish something that no one before him ever did to liberate the genie, to free the genie. And then, of course, the genie becomes his friend. So now power is not something that's threatening or it's no longer something that could be a dagger in his back, but now power has allied himself with him because it's been set free. It's not what he seeks above all things. In contradiction to that, you have Jafar. Jafar with his Nietzschean understanding of power. For those who don't know, Frederick Nietzsche was a philosopher. Um, I use that term loosely, loosely <laughs> in, the, uh, in the 19th century. And he had this notion of will to power. 
will to power that in the end what really dominates the, the world really gives people freedom is the ubermensch the 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 overman the our ability to dominate someone else is what ultimately leads to our freedom and our happiness which as far is a perfect embodiment of that and he even takes the lamp and he wishes explicitly to be the most powerful being in the world i want unlimited power he says and so he wishes to be a genie the ultimate irony of that is that genies in the end are prisoners because of their power that reminds me by the way of gaudium et spes when it mentions on its section uh regarding technology how although man has created magnificent things in the past century these things have simultaneously been his greatest source of sorrow and power when it's used for its own sake or for the sake of ego never ends well and i think that's a great lesson from aladdin that our kids can learn as they watch it is that no matter how much you may seek power no matter how selfishly you may use it in the end you'll always end up miserable or even worse you'll end up a prisoner mm, well said you see the theme of of slavery and being trapped yeah. Uh, and all the major characters of Aladdin, even Jasmine, is trapped within her palace. You know, she she references her little bird in the cage and says that bird's more free than I am. Yeah. Even though I'm trapped in luxury, I'm still a slave. And I see that theme, too, in just about every Disney movie throughout this period. Um, this this sense that unless this pursuit of power, but with that power comes not more liberation, but more slavery. Yes. I'm thinking, too, of all the recent Marvel films. That's basically the theme of every villain in every Marvel film is the pursuit of unlimited power and control. Thanos in the Avengers series is, is the example par excellence. But what these movies keep reminding us again and again and again is that the more power you pursue, the more trapped you become by it, that yes. you're, you're, you're creating... Your, the own sh your own shackles that are going to enslave you. You think power will liberate you, but it won't. Selflessness and and delivering your will to the will of God and the will of of the good is what will liberate you. What will make you truly free and thus truly human. I think yes. It's like the the repeated message of all of these movies. You see it again and again. Yes, absolutely. All right, let's turn to a third movie from this Disney decade, this Disney renaissance, and that's The Lion King. The Lion King. Oh. Uh, man, so many quotable lines in this. And I must say, like when I, when I saw this film as a kid, I loved the story and it was deeply moving. But then re-watching it as a parent, when you, see, when you view all these Disney movies, these classic Disney movies, through the parent-child lens, having been a parent, it unpacks so many new layers. And it's, it's, I've rewatched some of these classic films and have had tears in my eyes. You know, nobody, nobody does better than Disney and Pixar now, especially this dynamic between parents and children. You yeah. know, everything from The Lion King all the way up to Finding Nemo. Um, I think they've honed in on this primordial bond between father and son, between mother and daughter. Um, think through like all of these major, uh, even recent films, the, the parenthood dynamic where the parents die away. You know, almost every Disney movie, the parents die like pretty right. quickly or they have recently died. And so there's this wound, this emptiness among the people trying to figure out who am I? What's my identity? What's my mission? And we see that, don't we, in The Lion King? Oh, yeah. I, I have a whole talk that I literally travel and give retreats on just about The Lion King. <laughs> so uh, for me, The Lion King and holds Father a special Blake can place. come to your parish or your diocese and give his talk <laughs> on The Lion King. Bring yes. him into your parish. And believe it or not, it's funny because I have this brochure thing that when I get invited for conferences or retreats or something, I, you know, I send it out. It has a list of all my talks. And this is one of the most popular ones. It's hilarious, especially for young adults and teen retreats, you know. Um, but even some of the adults, they, they, just, they just love The Lion King, sort of the Disney theology talk. Um, but The Lion King is the first Disney movie I remember seeing. Um, and it's, it holds a very special place in my heart because of my relationship with, with my father in particular. Um, when Mufasa and Simba are sitting there under the stars uh, and Mufasa is telling him about all of his ancestors and his responsibilities and how much he loves him as a son, I was blessed with a very good father. Uh, and my dad used to do that with me. We'd sit out in the backyard and lay down. He'd put on a blanket and we'd look at the stars and he would tell me stories. Uh, and so until this day, Lion King just really brings me to tears thinking about my father. Uh, there's so much in this film that is Catholic. 
Uh, but one of the foundational elements is the notion of identity, vocation, and woundedness. So you have Simba, who is the beloved anointed. He's literally anointed by Rafiki, a.k.a. the priest. He's anointed by Rafiki at the beginning of the movie uh, through a, really a, a baptismal sense of ritual. Uh, he's anointed a prince, an heir of the kingdom, the kingdom of his father, just as we're anointed heirs of the kingdom of God. And the enemy comes, Scar, and slays his father. And what's fascinating is there's there's this scene that I use in all my talks of Scar crawling down from a single tree that's in the middle of this desert and Simba sitting underneath it. He's slithering down like a snake from this tree and he tempts Simba to try to roar. So Simba tries to make Simba really show himself, have to prove that he's lion enough, that he's strong enough in order to be Mufasa's son. Well, that's the snake in the Garden of Eden. Does God, did he really tell you that you couldn't eat from this tree? Are you really a beloved daughter of God, Eve? Are you really a beloved daughter of God, Adam? You know, so Scar is just planting these seeds of doubt within Simba's mind about his own uh, dignity as a prince of all the lions. And that ultimately leads to Simba be believing that he's the one who murdered his father. And after Mufasa dies by being trampled through these wildebeest, he sacrifices himself. Scar comes in and he says, what have you done? Very accusatory. And he convinces Simba that he's a murderer. He says, you, mm. you are a murderer. So he defines his entire existence according to this sin, according to this fault. That's what Satan does with all of us. You can watch our episode on spiritual woundedness. I go into much more detail about this. But the enemy is always keen on defining us by our wounds, by our faults, by our failures. And it wasn't even really Simba's fault. Scar was the ultimate culprit, but he convinced Simba that he's the murderer. And Simba takes this and he falls into that woundedness and despair and he runs away. And what does he do? He ends up le leading a hedonistic lifestyle of selfishness, Hakuna Matata. It means no worries. He meets these friends <laughs> who I always call, you know, these are the frat friends that you meet at college who are like, ah, oh, come on, you don't need to have that past. Don't worry about it. Just eat, drink, be merry for tomorrow you die. So really at first, Timon and Pumbaa are not the best of friends. Um, they're, they're convincing Simba just to drown himself in the pleasures of this life in order to go away from his woundedness. It's only when Nala, the feminine genius, comes into play and she says to him, have you forgotten who you are, Simba? Have you forgotten about Mufasa? And Simba's fighting against this now because she's reminding him of his essential character and identity. And ultimately, it's him meeting Rafiki, who, again, is the priestly character. And Rafiki takes him to this forest. This forest is filled with weeds and vines, and Simba's getting trapped on the inside, and he's tripping, and he's falling all over himself. That's all the wickedness of life that he's gone through. That's him ripping through his selfishness and his ego. And then he finally comes to a pool of water. And Rafiki puts his face to the pool of water. And in there he sees his father's reflection. And that's when Mufasa says, you are my son. And Simba remembers his identity. I mean, that's the baptism. Rafiki's bringing him back to his baptismal identity. And that's when, of course, Simba goes and combats the enemy. He puts the enemy on his back. Scar and says, you're the murderer. I'm not the murderer. You're the one. The enemy is the one who put that lie in me. And he's putting it back on the enemy again. And that's what now allows him to be king. All the places that were dead are now coming back to life. That's reminiscent of the psalm, that the valleys that used to be barren are now filled with springs of life. I mean, so again, I could go on and on. <laughs> but within that film, you see all these Christian sentiments. And ultimately, it's about remembering who we are as beloved sons and daughters of God and not allowing the enemy to t steal that identity from us. You know, the Lion King is not a perfect depiction of Christ, but uh, Simba is a Christ figure as well that, you know, as you just explained, yes, he's certainly a metaphor and a parallel for human experience, trudging through the, the darkness, overgrown weediness of, of sin. You get to the, the graveyard where they have all the, the bones yeah. and the jackals and the hyenas, and you need to discover who you are and stand up and, and find redemption and conversion. All that's true. But Simba, I think, also is a strong depiction of Christ, especially in his relationship to the Father. You mm -hmm. know, after his father is killed, he always is, is looking up to the heavens, up to the stars. And then you have 
that booming James Earl Jones voice, you know, who every time I think of the voice of God, it's got James Earl Jones's <laughs> right. uh, uh, voice coming down from the heavens, you know, remember who you are. And that has always struck me as like Christ in the desert during the 40 days, Christ in the garden of Gethsemane. You know, you, you have this, this Jesus in the gospels kind of not wavering. I, I don't want to discount his, his transcendence, but you know, this, this not completely crystal clear picture of who exactly I am. And it's the father who, who's repeatedly feeding that mission into him. It's Christ listening to the father to discover who he is. Yeah. Uh, I think Simba depicts that well. Yeah, absolutely. If there, if that scene, if it doesn't bring tears to your eyes, you got to get a soul check because <laughs> uh, when, when Simba looks up to the sky and says, I don't know what to do, like, father, help me. And Mufasa just keeps on repeating, remember who you are. That's one of the most repeated words in Hebrew, by the way, in the Old Testament. Shema, Shema, remember Israel. Remember, remember. According to the Jewish mindset, it's forgetfulness that leads to sin. When we forget who we are, that's what happened to Adam and Eve. They forgot. They forgot that they were beloved children of God, and that's why they turned inward into egoism. So Mufasa, the way that he helps Simba is by simply saying, remember Remember, remember, go back to that initial love that you felt when you were anointed on Pride Rock. And for us, it's go back to that initial love that was felt when you were anointed priest, prophet, and king of the kingdom of God. All right, we've done Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King. Those are actually my number one, three, and two favorite Hmm. Disney movies. For me, it's Beauty and the Beast, Lion King at the top, and Aladdin right behind them. But let's do your favorite Disney movie. Yes. I know I know for a fact is The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, you could say, uh, you know, besides that scene in Fantasia I mentioned earlier, maybe the most explicitly Catholic film. It takes place in a grand Catholic cathedral. There's there's priests, there's vicars, there's prayers. Um, but tell us why do you like this film so much, and what are what are the the religious or the moral or the, or the virtuous themes that stick out most yeah. to you? Well, on a more superficial level, I mean, the music, definitely. Alan Minkin himself said it was one of the best compositions he ever wrote, and I agree with him. Along with Beauty and the Beast, this is probably the best Disney music that there is, just its quality, its its depth. It's, of course, their lyrics are magnificent. They use Latin on a regular basis in their hymns that they sing throughout the movie. So it's a very, it's just Catholic to the core, <laughs> unabashedly Catholic. They chant the Salva Regina in the film. They do the mea culpa, the confidior. It's just, it's it's unbelievable. Um, so many things to say about The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Yes, by far my favorite Disney movie. So at the beginning of the film, we see how Jean-Claude Frollo, and this is loosely based, by the way, on Victor Hugo's book, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, which is quite an epic, typical Victor Hugo book about this thick. Uh, but uh, Jean-Claude Fro- Frollo is fighting against gypsies, uh, these sort of gypsies that are invading the city of Paris um, at the turn of the 18th century. And uh, he ends up killing one of the gypsy women who has a child, and the child's deformed, has a, a severe physical disability. And Frollo wants to murder the child by throwing it down a well. But the deacon of the cathedral comes out and challenges Frollo and says, what have you done? You've killed someone on the steps of Notre Dame, on the steps of Our Lady, and you have to make retribution for this sin. And as uh, retribution, as this reconciliation with Our Lady, Jean-Claude Frollo is entrusted with raising the child that he was going to kill, whom he names Quasimodo, which in Latin means half-formed. Uh, and Quasimodo is put in the bell tower since Jean-Claude is this proud uh, sort of arrogant man. He doesn't want anyone to know that he's raising the child. Uh, and he's under the care of the monks and the priests there at, at the Basilica of Notre Dame. After that opening, a single line is sung. And that line is, what makes a monster and what makes a man? That's the theme that underlies the rest of the movie. And it's really done through, th- through four characters. So... At the center, you have Esmeralda. Esmeralda is one of the gypsy women. She was a child when Quasimodo was a child, and now she's an adult, and she's a dancer. And she really represents the liberation, the freedom of the human spirit, um, what it means to have a human life that's fully alive. So she's not lustful. She's beautiful. She knows her beauty. She is very engaged in reality. She sings a song called God Help the Outcast, that, which is one of the most beautiful songs of the whole film, where she's literally asking the Blessed Mother to, to give refuge to the homeless and to the poor. So she just has this sort of well-rounded, full human life. 
And around Esmeralda, they do a great job constructing, again, based on Victor Hugo's notion, these three characters who are struggling to have the fullness of life. Quasimodo, Phoebus, who's the captain of the guard, and Jean-Claude Frollo, who by that point is one of the judges of Paris and considered a very pious and holy man. And you see these three characters all respond in different ways to the fullness of life that is Esmeralda and her beauty. They're all attracted to her, but they respond in these three very different ways. So you have Jean-Claude Frollo, and Frollo responds with, at first, this puritanical notion that how could this filthy woman, how dare she dance and show herself? She should cover herself more. She's a demon from hell. I have to destroy her. I have to burn her at the stake. But secretly, as John Paul II teaches in Love and Responsibility, Puritanism is not actually purity. Puritanism is always a cloak for a hidden lust within the heart. And Frollo secretly lusts for Esmeralda. And this lust eventually consumes his mind, his heart, his body, and soul, so much to the point where he says, either you will be mine and I will have your body, or I'm going to burn you at the stake. So you see this perverted response to the fullness of life, this, this response that just wants to take life for itself and to devour it from the inside out for its own selfishness and lust. Then you have Phoebus. Phoebus initially lust over Esmeralda openly, but as the story progresses, he learns to love her with this romantic, pure, agapeic sense of love until he eventually abandons his career and he suffers the pains of death in order to show his love to Esmeralda and he's ultimately spared. Then finally, you have Quasimodo. Quasimodo, who, of course, in his own disabilities, cannot have a full understanding of this romantic sense of love, although he's infatuated with Esmeralda in this pure sense, because Esmeralda shows him kindness when everyone else is mocking his disability. And so he wants to be romantic with her, does not possess the capacity appropriately, and over time he learns to be friendly with her in this platonic notion. He, he develops this deep friendship with Esmeralda, and ultimately, it's that friendship that leads Quasimodo out of the shadows of the bell tower into the public square. And he's accepted now by the entire city of Paris. So there's so many anthropological points that are expressed in this film that I could go on for hours. Mainly that line, however, that I'll return to is what makes a monster and what makes a man. And then what makes a monster is whenever we turn inward. When we live a life of selfishness like Jean-Claude Frollo and like Phoebus was living in the beginning – we only want to live a life that feeds our own desires. But what makes a man, what makes someone human? Selflessness and love, giving themselves fully to another. That's what makes them human. Uh, and the movie actually ends with that line. What makes a monster, what makes a man, tells the bells, the bells of Notre Dame, of our Blessed Mother. You know, to bring it full circle back to Beauty and the Beast, you see that same theme, that same dichotomy between monster and man. You have the beast who clearly looks like a monster and acts like a monster. And then you have Gaston, who is this paradigmatic manly man, you know, who's strong and he hunts and he's misogynistic and everyone loves him, you know. But what the story reveals throughout the end is that the, the roles are quite reversed, that it's actually Gaston, the monster, undeniably, and the beast, who only seems to be a monster because of his looks, but is actually revealed to be substantially a man, the, the most, you know, pure man that, that you could find because he's a man grounded now in love. So yeah. that's another uh, overarching motif of all, all the Disney films is appearances can be deceptive, that what may look like a monster or a man can be actually the opposite. Yes. Yeah. And that, again, teaches us from a young age that things are not always as they seem. Uh, but we need to learn how to see with deeper eyes. That's one of the mm. greatest gifts that Disney gave me as a child growing up and that my parents helped form through conversations watching these movies. And I know we'll get to the parenting of, uh, of Disney kids here in a minute. But, uh, but for me, we, you know, we would watch these movies growing up. And then my mom, who was just – my mom's a master. She's literally a theologian, but she's just a master of these kind of storytellings and forming virtue in children. But my mother my father would talk to me about these movies. We'd think through them. I would cry sometimes watching them. My mom would be like, why are you crying? And not in a sense of accusing me, but really she, she wanted me to learn the source of my tears. Well, I'm crying because it's beautiful. Why is it beautiful, sweetie? You know, why, do, why are you crying? What touched you? What made you cry? Well, he lost his dad or he lost his mom or he gave up his life for her. And, and so it's forming these virtues deep, deep within my soul. And that's one of those great gifts of Disney is that it teaches children you need to see with a different kind of eyes. The eyes of the world are deceptive, but the eyes of the heart, the eyes of the soul, those are the ones that really see deepest into reality. 
I think that line, things are not as they seem to be or things are, are not as they appear, is actually explicitly said in Aladdin a few yes. times, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And it strikes me that that is an anti-materialistic philosophy that, that we're indoctrinating our children in, in a healthy way, yes. that the material world is not all of reality, that things are different than what they may seem. And I think it's also a propedeutic to transubstantiation, to use a, a, a mouthful of jargon right there. Right. But it's, <laughs> it's teaching our kids to understand that the Eucharist is perhaps not as it may seem, that to our senses it appears to be bread and wine, mere material elements, but that the deeper reality is something substantially different. So here's my argument, that the Disney films are the best Eucharistic formation program you can give your, your kids. So let's scrap RCIA and just watch Aladdin. Just and, watch and Aladdin, Aladdin exactly. King and I'm Hunchback sure we won't get Richard any hate mail for that, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> well, people people can't accuse us of not making bold proposals after right, that. Right, exactly. I'm sure I'm going to email tomorrow from the office of Bishop John Noonan. Uh oh, <laughs> Father Blake, you've been. Uh, thank you for volunteering to be reassigned to Ethiopia. We look forward to your mission. <laughs> Where you can watch as many Disney movies as you like. Yeah. Okay, let's let's close with a, a couple more thoughts. Now we've talked about the history of Disney. We've talked about some of the significant key films, especially those in the 90s. Let's talk about Disney and parenting. We've skirted around this a little bit. I've talked about how our family loves Disney Plus. You know, obviously not every movie, not every show on Disney Plus. We're very discerning, but we we're a movie loving family. I know your family is too, Blake. And we have spent hours and hours and hours enjoying a lot of the classic Disney films over and over again, watching them, talking about them. I've said this earlier, I think there's no better way to stimulate the imagination, the sense of wonder, of course, bracketing the reading of these stories, which I encourage and which all our, our, our kids do, but the movies themselves do this in a visually evocative way yeah. that after watching a Disney film, you again are awakened to a renewed sense of wonder, awe, uh, anti-materialism, all of these are good things. All of these are good senses and worldviews that we want to inculcate in our kids. So to me, parenting and watching Disney films go together hand in glove. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I, I think that's so important. Again, it's not necessary. It's not like you can't raise your children without them, but they're also not a threat. Um, I, I think they could be great catechetical tools and, and virtuous to, tools to, to help form our children in these deeper ways of being. I know for me growing up, as I, as you mentioned, Brandon, uh, every Friday was movie night in my house. And exactly my mom and dad, we, we had the I same if, routine. I don't know if We'd we ever talked pizza. about that. That's what we do too. We you always do have, that too? We, have, we have cheese pizza and movie night every Friday night. Dude, I didn't know you guys did that. Look at that. You see, yeah. we still learn something new about each other all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, every Friday night in our family was movie night and we'd always order pizza and, uh, and especially because Fridays, you know, we don't eat meat, so it'd be cheese pizza. And uh, and so we'd make – my dad would make a, uh, a bed on the floor for the kids. And uh, he'd put pull pillows and stuff there so all of us kids would lay there together. And then my mom and dad would sit on the couch, you know, together. And we'd always watch a Disney movie when we were younger. And as we got older, the movies got more mature. Again, nothing with sinful or evil content, but, but, um, but just more mature sort of live action films. But when we were kids, it was always Disney movies every Friday night. And it really did form my childhood in a very positive way on multiple levels. So, again, on the levels that we've spoken about, so this virtue formation, uh, the fact that I'm learning things from these films. But on a deeper level, my mom and dad were on the couch together and we, I was there with my brothers and my sister and our family was with one another. That's a precious, dear memory that I do thank Disney for, um, and that we all till this day have these common stories, you know, like I'll, when I'm on the phone with my youngest brother, with Jacob, you know, we'll just randomly start singing Hakuna Matata, or we'll, <laughs> you know, we'll start going through the bells of Notre Dame and sort of, oh yeah, I remember that scene, what have you. So there's just this unitive uh, factor as well in this common language that I think is given through the great storyteller of Disney uh, that's really, really amazing. So I'm right there with you. I mean, my family is totally formed. We're a movie family because we're a very philosophical family, and films tend to be very philosophical and theological. So we enjoy watching movies uh, for that reason. And Disney is no exception. <laughs> 
I remember one of the origin stories of Disneyland itself, uh, Walt Disney was taking his kids, I think it was on, like somewhere in the 1950s, he had a couple little girls at the time and he took them to a carousel and loved it. He loved sitting on the, on the bench, watching the girls go round and round. They were so excited and filled with exuberance. And the thought struck him sitting on that bench that the carousel is a, a type of entertainment or attraction that brings the family together, mm. but it's not enough to bring them together the whole day. And so that was kind of his idea is like, I, w I wish there was a place where you could go as a family that was a family themed entertainment that could keep the family together throughout the whole day and thus gave birth to Disneyland in California and then eventually to the the four parks we have here but that was the better cycling. Disney Disney World yeah oh the, yeah the, much the better Disney one. when we yeah. say Disney we're referring to Disney World of yeah course, please not it's not it's older brother and yeah predecessor. Disneyland is cute but yeah Disney World is <laughs> <laughs> I, rem I remember we uh what was it four or five years ago our family took a big road trip out to California we mainly were going out there to see Bishop Barron and hang out with him a little bit but we took our big 12 passenger van we drove from Orlando to California yes and back and we just did a few hours each day so it was like a 32 day trip during the summer it's amazing but we stopped at california and we went to disneyland for the first time as a family after having gone to disney world for years and years and years and and no offense to our californian <laughs> listeners no offense to those who love and enjoy disneyland um i think if you would only experience disneyland it would be amazing but going from disney world to disneyland it's kind of underwhelming. Oh, like yeah. We, you know, we, we did not do any of the attractions that were the same as the one in Orlando. So when you exclude those, there was barely enough to fill like half a day or three quarters of it. It's so much smaller, so much more constricted and packed. Um, so if you want the Disney experience, the full Disney experience, you guys got to come down here to where Blake and I are in, in Orlando and go to the, the real Disney World. And this this is the point of the podcast when you see the number for Disney annual passes go across <laughs> the bottom of our screen. <laughs> and you can purchase and a four day four park pass at one eight hundred four nine Disney. Yeah, four nine Disney with the promo code Burrowshire. <laughs> <laughs> you get twenty percent off. <laughs> well, we're already we were already hawking Ignatius Press pr uh, books at our last episode, so maybe. Uh, Maybe next month we'll reveal that we now have sponsorships from both Ignatius Press and Disney for Disney, this yeah. podcast. Well, we'd be able to retire if that was the case, Brandon. <laughs> <I promise you. laughs> if Disney was sponsoring us, you know. <laughs> All right. But, well, let's let's wind to a close. Any final words about Disney, the faith, theology, anything else? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people may ask, you know, why have this episode? I think a lot of people are going to love this episode. I know some of my friends in particular just have been dying for us to sort of speak about Disney and theology. But some people may, may be asking, like, why? Why is this important? Why do you see this as relevant? Well, again, the, as Catholics, we have the responsibility to develop that inner eye which identifies virtue, goodness, beauty, truth, and all things, and is able to utilize them for the sake of the gospel. When I sit down and watch a Disney movie, I'm not doing that just because I like to sing along with the songs, although I do. But there's something more there. The reason why I weep when watching Lion King is because I've been touched by Christ. It's because I, I've encountered the Lord. And I have to also recognize the fact that there are hundreds of millions of people on this planet who have also cried watching The Lion King. And there's a bond there that unites us, and we have this obligation to understand that bond, to know why that is, in order to draw and to mature it to its higher good, which is the salvation of souls. So that's the purpose of this podcast at its deepest level, is we, we're always trying to form our own hearts and to grow with our fellow millennials and Gen Z in that art of discernment, in that art of of being able to identify and see grace wherever grace is to be found, as St. Augustine says. Um, and so I'm. those are the closing thoughts I'll leave you with. I mean, I, I do encourage parents, if you haven't, um, to especially for some of those earlier Disney films, please watch them together as a family. You know, Friday movie nights are a great idea. Um, I just cherish them as a child, and now I know that, that the Vought family does that as well. But, um, you know, anything like that is just so good and informative for, for your kids. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I, that's sort of where my heart is on it. It just struck me now that I think the the group that has continued this tradition of storytelling in the original Walt Disney framework is Pixar. Yeah. You know, Pixar now is owned by Disney. Steve Jobs sold it to Disney for like $7 billion, something yeah. like that. And you could argue they've maybe veered here or there from their original storytelling mission. But I think 
Pixar picked up where the original Disney animators left off. Yes. And so maybe maybe our listeners can tell us if you want us to do a, a follow-up episode on some Pixar films, you know, think about Toy Story, Finding Nemo, which is resonant with Christian themes. Or, oh, yeah. You know, The Incredibles or Cars or Up or uh, WALL-E, all, all of these deeply thoughtful and moving films. Maybe, maybe we'll do a, a Pixar and theology episode in the future. Oh, I would not mind at all. We could just start another podcast called <laughs> Disney and Theology in well, let's for the not, next let's not, 10 years. Let's not <laughs> stop here. We'll, do, we'll just do another hour here on Pixar and Theology while we're going. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. All right. Well, listen, thanks so much for joining us, for listening, for watching. All your kind words of support and encouragement. Blake and I get the emails. We see the comments. We we love doing this podcast and, and the joy that it's brought so many of you. So, Thanks for joining us for these conversations, and we'll see you next time here on the Borough Shire Podcast.